welcome to Legally Speaking with me, Tarun Nangya. This in our continuing series on Justice Dhananjay Chandrachut, who will take over as the Chief Justice of India on the 9th of November. And this is a long tenure. We are looking forward to a two-year tenure. And there are a lot of hopes from Justice Dhananjay Chandrachut. We are going to discuss uh, those today. Of course, uh, his views are well known. He's also one of our most vocal judges. We get to hear him from time to time when he addresses students uh, various gatherings. So, of course, it is always good to know a judge's mind because he interacts with people. That is also a good thing about him. But we'll get to know more. And I have a very eminent panel joining me today evening. I have with me Senior Advocate Percival Birimoria, who practices at the Delhi High Court and the Supreme Court of India, and also a very well-known arbitrator. Good to see you, Mr. Birimoria. And looking forward to some interesting anecdotes and inputs from you. I have with me Abhimanyu Bhandari. Uh, he practices at the Delhi High Court and the Supreme Court of India. Good to see you, Mr. Bhandari. Uh, I have with me Tahira Karanjawala from Karanjawala and Company, which is one of India's leading litigation law firms at the Supreme Court of India. Good to see you, Ms. Karanjawala. Uh, and at the outset, may I request uh, uh, Senior Advocate Percival Billy Moria that in the first two, two and a half minutes or so, what kind of expectations do you see from Justice Dhananjay Chandrachud? And of course, in a long, long time, we have a Chief Justice of India with a clear-cut two-year tenure. It's like a little over two years, a uh, little over two years. So that is enough to also achieve and accomplish uh, any major tasks that you know he would have thought of bringing in or driving in change in the administration also. Over to you, Mr. Bilimodia. Well, uh, first of all, let me say when when you invited me for this, I spoke to some friends in the Bombay bar. And uh, of course, everyone was very complimentary, which, uh, you know, you can't really uh, disagree at all. Uh, a very, very eminent uh, judge uh, is now becoming chief justice for two years. I think it will be a very good opportunity for him to uh, ensure that uh, some of the issues that he's already propounded in both in his lectures to the uh, to the students as well as in some of his judgments i think if one thing stands out very distinctly is uh, his uh, determination to break down gender barriers i think in all uh, some of his decisions right from the recent one uh, you know the adultery case the love jihad case there is a common theme I think he believes in gender equality in the in the case of uh, Nitisha, where permanent commission for women was granted. So I think we we can look forward to more of the same. Uh, I personally really like uh, one of the judgments he delivered when he was at the Bombay uh, High Court, when uh, you know he essentially said that look, uh, the trustees of a secular trust have to only administer in a secular manner. Uh, this was a matter pertaining to the rights of, uh, you know, Parsi women, uh, you know, which is a very disputed issue, which is very dear to my heart. And I think uh, social justice is what uh, Justice Chandrachud is all about. Uh, additionally, I must tell you that uh, someone told me a very uh, interesting anecdote. Uh, he's very kind to uh, junior lawyers. So there was one junior lawyer when he was in Bombay who turned up asking for an adjournment and he didn't have any papers. And he just quipped that uh, appearing in court without papers is like Sachin Tendulkar coming out to bat without a bat in his hand. <laughs> so a little sense of humor at the same time, a very serious personality and uh, something to look forward to in his tenure. Thanks. Thanks for that opening comment, Mr. Billy Mori, and thanks for sharing those anecdotes. I'll go to our next panelist, Mr. Abhimanyu Bhandari. Now, he and Justice Chandrachud have one thing in common. Uh, both got educated abroad, but turned to India when they wanted to practice law. Justice Chandrachud got educated in, way back in 77 at Harvard. Uh, Abhimanyu read law at the Oxford University, but turned to India. Increasingly, we see young professionals going abroad and settling down there. They work for law firms there. Uh, but... Uh, there is also a young breed of professionals who prefer to come back to India and practice law, especially litigation, which is very tough and competitive, if I may say so. Over to you, Mr. Bhandari, for your opening comment on Justice Dhananjay Chandrachur. Thank you, Tarun. I'll take it from where you've left it at. Just studying abroad doesn't make much of a difference. Um, a very interesting example is that both Honorable Justice Chandrachur and the Chief Justice of the U.S. Court, uh, Chief Justice John Roberts, both were educated at Harvard. 
but uh, you saw what John Roberts had to, uh, he concurred with the judgment that the US uh, uh, Supreme Court gave on the abortion case in Dobbs and Jackson. And you saw what the Supreme Court of India did uh, a bench headed by Honorable Justice Chandrachud. So both educated in Harvard, but can have very different views. Um, in my personal opinion, the view of the Supreme Court of India was far more progressive in the correct view um, and in tandem with our times. So just because you've studied abroad or you've studied in a particular school doesn't matter. What matters is how you think about things and how you appreciate legal arguments and, and allow judgments to... Uh, grow with the times that uh, change our uh, our civilization and the way we think uh, in today's times. Um, I think uh, we are uh, uh, we are uh, as I think Justice Nariman once said in a conference. I think a couple of years back, and I very, I don't know which conference it was, but I remember him saying this. He said that when Justice Chandrachu takes over as the Chief Justice of India, it's going to be a golden era for us, and I have no doubt that that's going to be very true. And, you know, there is a lot of uh, excitement with him coming in as Chief Justice of India. And uh, he's, the, the bar that he has set for himself is also very, very high. I'll tell you, Tarun, this summer I found myself in London and uh, uh, Honorable Justice Chandrachud was there, who was giving a few lectures in London, Oxford and at various other places in the country, in UK. And I, am, I was amazed the kind of excitement it had generated People from all walks of life had come there to hear him. There were students from all other universities. For example, I attended the London School of Economics talk. And it was a house full affair. Parliamentarians, jurists, students, politicians, people were flocking there. Social media was on fire with his speeches. I, I saw senior partners of you know, UK and American law firms who don't litigate, but are corporate partners you know, saying good things about, about, about his speeches that he made at various universities in the UK. I think he brings uh, the way he communicates and his lectures, because, you know, there's one thing when you see a judge through his judgments, but Justice Chandrachud, also you learn a lot about him and how he thinks through the speeches and, and, and the conferences that he attends, and he speaks to us about it. And I think that, you know, it's, very, it's a very exciting time, uh, especially as uh, Percy Billy Moria said, for young lawyers, um, he is he has in many conferences spoken about lawyers who don't come from uh, families with high networks. He has spoken how difficult it is for a young lawyer who is not necessarily connected to the Indian Delhi system or Bombay system to find a job. He spoke how you know uh, uh, job placements in India are the most unstructured manner, where someone picks up the phone and calls someone and says, "Give him a job." And he spoke about the inherent disadvantages that law students would face when they join the profession. This shows that today we are going to have a chief justice and especially a sitting judge of Supreme Court who thinks about the problems that lawyers who are first generation lawyers and you know, not also first generation, but lawyers who come from a disadvantaged background, probably you know, who don't have relatives in Delhi, in Bombay or where they practice to get a job, to make a mark at the bar. Most importantly, you know, a lot is uh, already written and said about his judgments, and therefore that's not something that I'm going to talk about. But I must make a point on a more practical basis. We practice every day in various courts. We, as lawyers, lose some, win some. But it's very painful if we go to court and we come out as, you know, injured. You know, when you go to play, like uh, Percy said, you know, don't enter the field with, with, without the bat. But, you know, when you go to bat, you may get bowled out, you may hit a six, you know, but you should not come out feeling injured. And that is something great about Justice Chandrachud. Whoever you are, whichever part of the country you've come from, whether you've practiced before in the Supreme Court or you've never, or whether it's your first day in the Supreme Court, you he will make you feel special. You get a hearing. No one lawyer comes out of his court thinking that they have not been heard. And that's very important. And that not being heard is a thing that doesn't end at the at the lawyer. Also remember, with the virtual system, today clients are logging in. They feel that there was a judge who heard them before he made a decision whether to allow their appeal or not to allow their appeal. And that is a very important thing, Tarun. Given the workload, given the kind of dockets, the number of files that are lying on a judge's table, the amount of cases they have to cover in a day, for every litigant to come out in today's time and feel, I was heard whether the judgment went in my favor or did not go in my favor. And I'm telling you, uh, there are instances when we've seen young lawyers go before him and he has actually 
encouraging them to argue and telling them, look, tell your facts like a story, you know, think it like a fiction story and tell us in, a, in, in that narrative. And that's very encouraging. He, he's not going to shout out at a young lawyer who probably doesn't know his brief and tell him, get out, you don't know what you're talking about. He's going to encourage that person to be better in his next performance. And that is a kind of judge that we need to encourage and inspire the bar. And he's become okay. so popular, not only in our country, but, you know, abroad. And when he visited and when he gives his lectures abroad, you have to see people were just rushing. You know, I feel he's like the Obama, you know, the hope that Obama brought when he was contesting the 2018 election, he was coming in. So what I feel is that he has really set the bar very high for himself. He's also going to have a very long tenure. So, you know, the amount of excitement he's created, he will have a Herculean task to continue to impress everybody because he comes in at a time when, you know, everybody is very excited about him taking over as the chief justice. So I'm Thanks. sure it's going to be the golden era of our, so, of, our, uh, of our judicial system. Thanks. Thanks. And we look forward to his tenure. Uh, as you also said, I'll go to Tahira Karanjawala now. Uh, Mrs. Karanjawala, you in a sense represent one of India's top litigating law firms who, who does a lot of work in the Supreme Court of India. And every decision that is made there in terms of even administration, listing of cases or any other issue has an impact on how you would work day to day and in a sense uh, uh, cater to your clients. And you see this, that for the first time, we have a Chief Justice of India with a two-year tenure, which means a lot of changes can happen. We already know uh, uh, how Justice Chandrachud was keen on his import system. He is pro-digital. Uh, keeping all this in mind, if you could share your opening comment with me. Thank you, Tarun. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more with Mr. Bil uh, Bilamoria and Mr. Bhandari when they said that there is a real sense of excitement today uh, at the bar uh, with uh, Justice Ch Chandrachur taking over as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, and this is for a couple of reasons. And the first and foremost, uh, you know, is because what is evident from the body of law that he's already laid down is that he has a deep respect for human rights and liberties. Uh, for freedom of choice, for freedom of speech and expression. And this is reflected throughout his judgments, whether it is the Inakti Johar judgment where he decriminalized um, consensual sex between same-sex couples, or whether it was the Hadia case that uh, Mr. Bill Moria referred to, where he upheld the freedom of choice of marriage uh, for every ad consenting adult. Uh, or whether it is a recent abortion case where he has, you know, uh, liberally interpreted the Medical Termination of Pregnancies Act to include uh, not only unmarried women, but even women who are not cis cisgendered women. So I think what's clear from, um, you know, his thought process and his vision is that today the new generation can look forward to uh, a more liberal uh, thought process going forward. So I think that's the biggest reason for the excitement at the bar. The second, as you correctly said, is that he's one of the uh, judges who has always been very technologically savvy. So even during COVID, his was the one court that functioned very smoothly right from the beginning. He has always encouraged lawyers to uh, resort to technology. He has always been a big proponent of the e-court system of e-filing. And I mean, he is also, of course, in his speeches adverted to this and uh, uh, has always encouraged lawyers to take up, to resort to technology. So I think that's something that we can all look forward to. Uh, and as you said, he has a two-year tenure. Um, so, I mean, even in terms of uh, putting in place systems as far as technology is concerned, that gives a big advantage. And as you said, administratively, it gives a big advantage. For instance, we saw Justice Lalit, and I think everyone can agree with me that while his tenure was short, uh, it was very celebrated because you had a lot of, you know, a lot of cases getting listed, getting disposed of, uh, cases which had been pending for a very long time. But again, he had only three months. With Justice Chandrachud, he has a good two years at his disposal. Uh, and he's also come from uh, presiding over the Allahabad High Court as Chief Justice. So he has the experience of handling a very, uh, you know, a very large and uh, challenging high court. So he has the experience behind him. And therefore, these are the you know, two or three reasons why everyone is very positive about his, uh, uh, about his tenure. And of course, as Abhimanyu also said, that he is one of uh, the judges who doesn't shy away from 
uh, interaction. In fact, in one of the judgments uh, which was passed during COVID, where the election commission had asked for oral observations of judges not to be reported uh, when there had been some uh, observations made that uh, the election commission was responsible for contributing to, towards the COVID, <coughs> etc. He had uh, he had prohibited such a, a restriction on the media, saying that no free flow of information must be uh, you know must be upheld, especially during a human humanitarian crisis. Okay. So he has never shied away from the media reporting on court proceedings. He has been in favor of live streaming of important cases. So I think this sort of interaction also gives a, a sense of confidence in the people uh, that you know the, the judges who are sitting at the top of the judiciary uh, have the best interests uh, at heart and also have uh, you know are uh, are you know freely expressing their opinion. Tyra, very broadly, you you pointed out this point of you know uh, what judges speak in court orally also uh, should be reported. So in a sense, I have seen many times that he's spoken, he's spoken pro media, pro the people rights to know. That is very encouraging. Of course, there is sometimes undue criticism, but he's taking in its, you know, his stride. He's like, no, no, but people have a right to know. I'll go to senior advocate Percy Billimoria. On uh, the digitalization of courts front, be it you or be it Abhiman you, I know both of you significantly would spend a couple of months in London each year or some other jurisdiction. Many times you have an appearance or two. Flying down all the way may not be the right idea. Do you think that with Justice Chandrachud coming in, e-court will get a lot of push because for all these days, we had a budget of 15, 1600 crores for the whole country. Do you think we need a lot more money and a lot could be done because, you know, from everything from acoustics to how the whole experience is matters. And not, not about the lawyer, but look at the litigant who has to travel all the way to Supreme Court for even routine matters. That gets a bit worrisome because, you know, from Kerala coming down to Delhi is not TD. It is also a matter of cost. Uh, how would you look at his tenure? Because at least we can take relief in one thing that he's pro-digitalization, pro-e-courts. Uh, any suggestions that also you may want to give? Well, uh, I must tell you, Tarun, that uh, uh, the expectation, of course, is that the use of e-courts is going to be uh, deepened and extended further. Uh, I myself am not a fan of e-courts. Uh, you mentioned London, uh, and I don't mind telling you that, look, uh, the moment COVID was over, all the lawyers were making a beeline for the courts. Now, of course, there are many advantages, some of which you have pointed out, which is access to uh, you know, people from remote areas and clients can log in and you know, see what's going on in their matter. But uh, there are certain uh, issues which are not entirely technological. Technological issues can be solved. One issue that people do not uh, often uh, touch upon is presence. There is something called FaceTime. So for a senior advocate to walk into court and make his presence felt, it's it just the energy. It makes a big difference, uh, no matter how uh, ne nebulous that may be, but there is a difference there. Uh, nevertheless, we all have to adjust to the <laughs> new age, as they say. Uh, there are certain issues. So for example, uh, in the old days, you know, you could always hand over documents across the bar and then the court will say, okay, why don't you put it on an affidavit? Uh, now you have to, you know, make sure that you are unmuted and, uh, you know, you have permission from the moderator. So these are practices which I'm sure, you know, Justice Chandrachud will be mindful of and it will be ironed out. But okay. that's a suggestion in a sense. That's 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 in the realm of suggestion. I'll go across yeah. to uh, Advocate Abhimanyu Bhandari. How do you see this being balanced out, the needs of the clients and the benefit that they have derived from being able to, uh, you know, since view your proceedings digitally, not being some clients even come from Canada, UK, US, it happens all the time at the Supreme Court. How do you see this going forward? And if you have any suggestions and submissions to make? Yes, Tarun, I, I actually am I'm a great supporter of uh, online hearings. I feel that the justice system and the court system is there to ensure that speedy justice is doled out to the litigants. Litigants want to see the court proceedings. Litigants want to see, especially in the top court when their case is being heard, because top court is the final court for them. And the fact that they can log in uh, from wherever they are, wherever they are, whichever part of the world they are, and they can see two things. A, 
whether they were heard, whether their case was presented in the correct manner that they felt it should have been presented in, whether their instructions to the councils was in you know whatever manner the council may deem it fit, whatever you know however he wants to make his presentation, whether that was made or not made. So I think that for the litigant, it's a win-win situation because he wherever he is, he can log in and he can see what a council who is he has instructed has done for him on a very, very important day for him. Because for everybody and everyone's case, Supreme Court is the most important day in their lives because you know that's the final court. Second, I think what is very good about the court system is, and please remember that we are a unique system of uh, justice, uh, of, of, of legal practicing system, where any lawyer around the world, the day he gets his advocate license, whether he's 21 years old or whether he's 40 years old, whether he's one year in the profession or whether he's 20 years in the profession, he has a right to represent and argue a case for a client before the Supreme Court of India. So we have a court system which allows lawyers from all walks of the society, all types of lawyers to come and present their case. This allows a huge opportunity for a lawyer, let's say, sitting in a remote part of the country to log in to see how the Supreme Court functions, what it is expected out of him, and to participate and make arguments. And that allows lawyers from around the world to participate in the, in the adjudicating process that the Supreme Court conducts. I think that's a huge achievement for our country. No other country, you know, countries create a lot of bars as to who can argue a case in the Supreme Court, who can't. Many jurisdictions have very, very tough rules as to when and, and what manner you can argue in, 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 in the top court of the country. In our country, every lawyer is allowed to argue his case. And we are a country which believes and emphasizes a lot still on oral advocacy. Therefore, for a lawyer to log in and argue is a huge relief for the client also. Client can now decide who they want should present their case. They don't necessarily have to depend on a pool of lawyers who they've never heard of, who they've never interacted with to present their most important case that they want to. So I think that's even good for a lot of lawyers because they can participate. Third, Tarun, as far as uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Billy Moria said that, you know, there is a bit of this energy of a senior advocate walking into the court. Sometimes that energy uh, Tarun, and please don't take me otherwise, and I hope no one takes me otherwise, is something which may be excessive, and we don't need that kind of energy. The kind of cases we have now, the amount of cases that are piling on, I think e-courts can really dispose of cases in a very quick manner. If the judge who's holding the court gives you a patient hearing on an online platform, that's more than enough that you need. Please remember in Supreme Court, largely my experience is that all the judges have already read your SLP, your special leave petition, and they have experience of 20 years or more than 20 years sitting at the bar. So they know, they, they, have a, they almost have a mindset as to where this case is going to go, what are the real issues. So the advocacy is there just to make that short point in a, in, a, in, a, in a limited time. So according to me, that can be done very easily on an online platform. So yes, I think the admission matters, Mondays and Fridays could be on online platform or someone should have a choice. So if someone feels that, no, he needs to go and argue a case. And I, and I rightly agree with Mr. Billamoria that there may be cases where a counsel may feel that he will be far more effective if he can make eye to eye contact with the judge and convince him, you know, recently I'm a great advocate of online hearing, but recently I argued a case before Supreme Court, which almost got dismissed and then it did not. And I felt that the fact I was standing there in the court and, and I could I could I could argue and be there and you know continue to be there did probably in my mind make some of a difference. I don't know. You know, we don't we can't read judges' that, minds. That's a, that's a fair but point. That, but yes, Tarun, I think it is extremely important that the digital uh, court hearings and virtual court hearings should continue and people should get an opportunity. There's one more part of this whole virtual court digital digitization, not only online hearings, even if there are physical hearings, given the kind of volume of annexures that we have nowadays, the number of volumes of SLPs we have nowadays, the fact that courts are now emphasizing more and more on a paperless court is not only eco-friendly, but is also something which helps lawyers focus on the real arguments and mark up their documents in a certain manner. You know, after I've started using the iPad and, 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 the, and, and the software that comes along with it, you know, various softwares, 
it helps you also focus on the relevant arguments and mark the relevant paras which you want to show this show the court in a in a in a sea of documents so i think that's another part of digitization and you know e e court that we talk about and i think that the fact that honorable justice chandrachud is really advocating that and encouraging lawyers to learn these skills i think it is extremely it's very very good and i think that uh, uh, for the time to come we all will benefit from you know making ourselves point, as much paperless as we can point very well taken i'll go across uh, to uh, tahira karanjawala from karanjawala and company uh, tahira how would how would would these things balance out do you think we will see increased adoption of digital courts under justice chandrachud uh, uh, like at least on uh, say uh, you know uh, on miscellaneous days uh yes thanks sir so i i also to be honest i'm a fan of uh, virtual hearings um is there a dis- advantage in appearing physically yes there is but i think given the overall pendency of cases and the overall burden of the system i would have to agree with abhimanyu that i think that having the option of virtual is certainly the way you know we should be going as a generation apart from it of course being better for the environment and you know also Uh, even if you're appearing uh, physically having the ability to keep all files on soft copy is a huge advantage not only for the lawyers but also for the judges i mean it, it, when you have and some some complicated commercial matters can go into hundreds of volumes and it's just much easier to organize even from a litigating firm's perspective because you know for us we have to carry copies of every judgment every uh, you know every uh, uh volume for multiple counsel etc this becomes much easier if everybody has uh has uh, has their files on soft copy so i think it's definitely a much more efficient way of functioning i think that covid has actually in a sense forced uh the indian litigation system which was otherwise criticized criticized for being um you know archaic in this particular area uh it's forced us to adapt to virtual i think that's the way to go i i think that is in any case the way of the future and i am personally happy that justice chandrachur is a proponent of uh, you know of that way of thinking i think it will uh, help us in the long run point i'll go to senior advocate percy bilimori as for you when you uh, argue high value cases needing a long argument do you feel that uh, uh, you know the advocate's presence in court will still be required for you know when you're doing a 45 minute or a 45 minute unless as opposed to a 2 3 minute appearance how do you see this progressing in the next 2 years well i agree with uh, you know my colleagues on the show uh, virtual is the way forward really but uh, first of all there is a little difference between a paperless brief and a uh, and a paper brief uh, on the one hand and a hearing which is virtual and a physical hearing so one can be in court and at the same time argue from your ipad i think that's really what i'm trying to do i've not yet uh, mastered that art but it's something which is inevitable and i'll <laughs> you know strain every nerve and sign you to uh, to be proficient at that but uh, at the same time uh, you know the presence uh, and i i contact is very important in court and i think uh, you know if i may even the bench sometimes feels the same there are many judges i know uh, who prefer uh, physical contact the person to be up front and uh, sometimes it is a little distracting from for them also i feel but at the same time we are going through a transition phase and i think uh, all of us will have to adjust to the ground reality uh, so really that that's it at the end of the day that is the reality and we must all live by that because you made this point of the ipad very quickly 30 second comment from abhimanyu mm-hmm. lawyers have to argue argue matters before different forums uh, you might be in the electricity appellate tribunal uh, then rush to delhi high court go across to competition commission or some other forum do you think the efficacy of digital can be used there because running from one court to the other to the supreme court then it's it's a difficult task if you have got uh, delhi traffic is there there are other issues sometimes advocates end up missing appearances because of this Uh, well i i i i think that advocates should take on as much work as they can do to begin with but look i think that ipad sol- solves a lot of that problem because then you are in a paperless court you don't have to run with files from one place to another you don't need to have people running with heavy heavy bags 
from one place to another. Second, I think the online hearings also help that. You don't have to go in the Delhi traffic from one place to another. You can, in the comfort of your office, log in and argue in the tribunal or argue in the court. But, you know, Tarun, what is important is that a part of our society has access to the best electronic gadgets. We have access to iPads. We have access to the latest Macs, iPhones, whatever. There are a large number of lawyers who don't have access to these devices. There are large numbers of lawyers who are earning for the training to how to use these devices. And we've seen Honorable Justice Chandrachud always speak as to how he wants to turn this digital divide into digital unite by ensuring and ensuring that systems are made to impart training to lawyers who want to learn on how to use e-devices to make their lives better so that they can, they can put forward a better argument in court when they're there or present their case in a better manner. So I think what is great is that we are not only having emphasis on people now that, you know, let's go online. Well, yes, very well. Let's go online. Let's, or, 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 Let's go online plus let's go paperless very well. But also there is an emphasis now from the justice system, the, from, from the judiciary headed by Honorable Justice Chandrachu that no, we need to train people on how to go online. We need to train people on how to go de- uh, on how to use these devices and to ensure that devices are available to them so that they can participate in the social, uh, you know, in this adjudicatory process, which will inherently soon become digitized. And, you know, the way things are going, if we lawyers don't start learning how to use digital devices, soon we will be outdated. Therefore, I think it's not only about making something online and to have emphasis on digital, but also to ensure that every part of the society, every lawyer from wherever he is, has access to learning as to how to use the device so that he can perform better as a lawyer. Point well, I think we are running out of time, almost out of time. So, but... uh... I think it was a good discussion today. Uh, we delved into uh, the tenure of Justice Chandrachur, the expectation, the huge expectations that he's generated. Uh, uh, and I know he has a huge fan base also in the younger lawyer set uh, because of the way he addresses his audience and speaks. Uh, uh, but I would like to thank Senior Advocate Percival Billimoria, uh, Advocate Abhimanyu Bhandari, Tahira Karanjawala from Karanjala and Company for spending time and joining us on this special show on Justice Chandrachur, who's going to be the 50th Chief Justice of India. He takes both, as I said, on November 9th. And uh, the audience for tuning in on the show. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.